Good morning, and welcome to worship on this 31st day of July 2022, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. We begin considering ourselves as a people called before a loving and merciful God. We begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose love for you endures forever. Amen. Gathered together this morning, near and far, let us join together before God and with each other, even if it's digital, to confess our sins. Merciful God, we ask that you would open us to the world around us. We have to confess to you that we have not always followed your path. We often, most times, have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. We worry about ourselves more than anything else. When we are met by those in need, we once again worry about what we need to do. And so we think it's better to pass by on the other side. We ask, gracious God, that in this time of worship, you would open us to your word, that you would open us to abundant life, and that you would set us again on the path of that life. We ask that you would save us from ourselves, and we ask that you would free us to love our neighbors, because you tell us that in doing so, you, we are given meaning in your life. Amen. Child of God, hear the good news. God does not deal with you according to your sins, but delights in granting you pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are absolutely forgiven. It's okay. You are beloved. You are free. And you are able to love just how Jesus does. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundance. And he thought to himself, What should I do? for I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, so let's consider TV shows of the 1980s. Do you remember the 1980s, a few decades back, and what were you watching at that time? I'm a child of the 80s. I'm a child of the 80s and 90s. This is when I came of age. And I can remember that in the 90s, uh, I was watching a lot of MTV and a lot of sports. That's just what teenagers did. Please do not hold this against me, but this is what I did, all right? But this morning, I want to think with you about television shows of the 1980s. Can you think about what you were watching? Parts of the 80s, I was pretty young, so don't hold this against me either, but I watched a lot of cartoons. Uh, I can think of a handful of cartoons that I watched. Voltron, He-Man, Spider-Man, X-Men, but my favorite cartoon was G.I. Joe. I love this, and I watched as much of it as possible. Again, I'm a child of the 80s. This might not have been what you were watching, but this is what I was watching in the 1980s. What shows do you remember? Can you draw anything? from 1980s television to mind. Where were you? What were you watching? How did you spend your time? I made a top five list, personal list, 
of shows that I was watching in the 1980s. And again, I was a kid, so don't hold this against me. Some of these are, might be kind of obscure, but I made a top five list of favorite shows of the 1980s. Number five, the fifth most favorite show of the 1980s for me was a show called Quantum Leap. Do you remember Quantum Leap? This was a show about a guy who got into some sort of weird science experiment, and now he was jumping bodies from time frame to time frame. So each episode was like its own little historical fiction. He would be a different person in a different time, and he was always hoping to get back to his time, to his body. And uh, he had a little hologram that could be in his time and speak to him and give him like a, a historical context and things. Quantum Leap, fifth most favorite show of the 1980s for me. Did you watch this? Do you remember this? Uh, fourth favorite show of the 1980s uh, as I grew up. This show was on Monday nights, and it was the show on before uh, Monday Night Football. So I watched this show and a quarter or two of football, and uh, this is partly what I watched in the 1980s. Do you remember the show that was on before Monday Night Football? Uh, the show is called MacGyver. Do you remember MacGyver? This is the guy who, like, each episode he would get, like, duct tape and a battery, and he would make, like, a whole car out of it or something to escape his problems. He was very intuitive. Uh, he was very smart, very scientific. You would think I would be scientific. This was, like, the earliest STEM scholar of all time. MacGyver, my fourth favorite television show of the 1980s. Third favorite television show of the 1980s was such a favorite that as a kid, I used to want to be the main character of the show. I would wear a black leather jacket. I wore a watch that I would speak into. I'd run around and I would be like, kit, kit, pick me up. I'm talking about Knight Rider, which is my third most favorite show of the 1980s. By the way, none of these have aged very well. If you watch any of them on Netflix or Hulu now, it's like cringe, cringe. But uh, shows of the 1980s, my third favorite was Knight Rider, the guy who drove the Knight Industries 2000, uh, the kit, the black bulletproof car uh, that he was all the time cruising around in and did all sorts of hijinks and adventures. Uh, second favorite show of the 1980s, probably the most obscure show on this, on this list. It only aired for a few years, uh, and I've probably watched every episode I don't know how many times. Again, cringe-worthy when you stream it now. My second most favorite show of the 1980s was a show called Air Wolf, uh, which had to do with a government helicopter that a guy who was sort of a loner flew on missions hoping to uh, eventually get to information and save his like POW brother. Uh, POWs happened a lot in 1980s shows. And my second favorite was Airwolf. I loved this show. Uh, Knight Rider, Airwolf had this cool uh, intro music, which again has an age very well. Do you remember any of these shows? These are my favorites. Don't hold it against me. I was a kid in the 1980s. What were you watching? My number one most favorite show in the 1980s is called The Wonder Years. I loved The Wonder Years. Uh, a half an hour sitcom uh, that I just felt like I sort of looked like Kevin Arnold. My life felt like it seemed like his, even though he was growing up in a different era. I was about the age he was. The stuff he talked about just sort of fit, right? So The Wonder Years is my favorite show of the 1980s. Maybe one of my top 10 favorite shows of all time, The Wonder Years. Do you remember any of these shows? What were you watching that I wasn't watching? I'm talking about this because I want to think about the content of what I watch. I want to think about the content of these shows, the shows that I've laid down as my favorite. I don't know if you picked up on this, but the backdrop of almost every single one of these is similar. There's a few outliers, but there's some uh, intertwined uh, similarities here, even in the cartoons. Uh, I talked about He-Man, I talked about Voltron, these sort of other planet uh, places that dealt with sword play and fighting. Spider-Man and X-Men, uh, which is this planet with supernatural powers, but again, combating, and there's a, always a fight in each one of those episodes. And my absolute favorite cartoon is built on militarism, and there were guns in every episode, lasers shooting all over the place. No one ever got hurt, uh, but there were lasers and guns that filled G.I. Joe. I bought all the toys and played with them and loved the, the militaristic background, all the handguns and all the equipment, and uh, I was big into all that. Remember my top five list? Quantum Leap doesn't per se deal with guns or violence, and maybe that makes it the only outlier on this whole list. Number four is MacGyver. He was always competing against a bad guy, uh, and you'll think, well, what was so violent about that? But it made its own statement on violence. I do not remember why, but the driving force, the theme of MacGyver, was that he refused to fight dirty. He refused to use guns 
against guns, and that's why he was making, uh, using duct tape and batteries to make cars to get out of there. Uh, he would blow stuff up, he would blow up people's whole places, and there were probably all sorts of collateral damage, but he would not use guns, and this was a big thematic part of MacGyver, and so guns and violence were part of the backdrop of it. And I'm not sure I got this as a kid, but it, just the fact of life that these shows had this. Knight Rider was always filled with guns. People were all the time shooting kids, and they would be like, oh, we can't affect it because it bounces off, which I don't know how realistic that is. The backdrop of this show is that in the pilot, Michael Knight is not named Michael Knight, he's named something else. He's a policeman, and the show literally shows him getting shot in the head. He loses his memory, and he's sort of rebuilt into Michael Knight, this vigilante that drives this car and does these missions. Uh, and so guns and gunplay uh, were a part of that show for sure. My second favorite show of the 80s is Airwolf, and that involved uh, a helicopter that was loaded to the teeth with weaponry uh, and with all sorts of things. And so this was sort of the culture that I imbibed. My number one favorite show is The Wonder Years, and you're probably like, oh, you know, that one's pretty safe. What violence was there in there? And you're right. Uh, for the most part, that show did not have any kind of violence. But never forget the pilot that triggered the whole sort of coming-of-age story for Kevin Arnold. The thing that triggered him is that his hero, who was Winnie Cooper's older brother who lived next door, was drafted and killed in Vietnam. And so there was this background of being uh, moved from childhood into adulthood in a way that circles around militarism, war, violence, guns. And so that is sort of there. And as a child of the 80s and 90s, you just sort of imbibe this stuff. And I'm thinking about it uh, because this morning I want to think about a distinction between existing just getting through and profound, deep living. There's a chance that if you've uh, been with me to this point and you've heard the gospel, you're thinking, wait a minute, this morning's gospel is about uh, finances, it's about uh, greed, uh, and, and John's talking to me about this culture uh, that's filled with stories of violence and guns and what that means for us. The reason why I'm thinking about this is, is because to me, the gospel is about money. But more than that, it centers on this person who looks to himself, who looks to himself and says to himself, soul, I need to handle this. And so this is a story of a man who says that he's a worshipful, trusting, uh, believing person, maybe, uh, but is a sort of practical atheist, really believes that all things come down to him and what he can control. And so it's a story of being turned in on self and it asks the question of what's the difference between existing and just getting through your days and real abundant life is. And this is a story of a guy who, in terms of money, is turned in on himself. And so I'm turning that into a story about people who, in terms of violence and protection and weaponry, can sometimes be turned in on ourselves. Now at this point, I need to interject something because you're, you're thinking, oh no, I can't believe he's on this and I want to push stop and I don't want to watch this anymore. And so I need to, to, to give you a caveat. And I want you to hear this, and I need you to hear this uh, before I go on. I am aware of the Second Amendment, and I am aware that it's part of the Constitution, and I even think I have some grip, I'm not a historian, but I have some grip on why it's in the Constitution, the right to bear arms. And I'll tell you that I think this is a valuable piece of our Constitution. I am not here to, to get you to change your mind on the Second Amendment. I'm not here uh, to think about, uh, oh, you know, we shouldn't be protected. Uh, I'm not here to put your safety at risk. And I'm not here to make ourselves sort of stripped back so that we can be, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, manipulated or, or a government can move against us. This is part of the, the Second Amendment, is this, this ability to keep a freedom from a government, uh, to make you do more, to make you go too far and do something you don't want to do. And I am a proponent of this. I'm a, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment in its own ways. What I am afraid of, though, is going past the Second Amendment and falling into this place where we've turned in on self, where security is about existing, it's about fearfulness, it's about our own sort of practical atheism. We'll have to take care of it ourselves and God will take care of it. And uh, we've moved past protecting each other as a society from other entities in society 
and we've fallen into this story of violence. And yes, this morning's gospel is about money, and I'm talking to you about guns, and you may not want me to talk to you about either thing, but I want to think about it. I'm not here to challenge your belief in the Constitution or the Second Amendment, but I am here to challenge what it looks like when we've turned in on ourselves. I'm here to ask you to think about what it feels like when we as a culture, as people, have become so individualized that the Second Amendment is about us and we've turned in on ourselves instead of uh, you know, the idea of militias, of communal protection from another entity, a thing that's done together. Sometimes we've just turned in on ourselves and we look at ourselves like the man in this morning's parable and we say, soul, you better take care of yourself because no one else is going to. I'm thinking about this because on Monday, July 18th, a man walked into a food court and he walked into the bathroom in the food court and he was in there for a very, very long time, something like an hour plus. And he emerged from the bathroom in this food court uh, in Indiana on Monday, July 18th at 5.57 p.m. This is a true story. He emerged from it armed to the teeth. Maybe he grew up uh, watching too much G.I. Joe where the lasers go all over the place or maybe, uh, you know, some subtle like backdrop of MacGyver or, or uh, uh, the Wonder Years, or maybe it was much more blatant violence, but it turns in on itself. And it turns in on itself even the way that we tell the story. Because when the man emerged from the bathroom, it became uh, one of those stories that is the same as all the stories we're hearing all over the place, and it is unbelievable to me that we keep hearing these. But it became another mass shooting. But in a twist on that, there was another man in the food court who was armed, legally. And the man was in the food court with his wife and was legally observing the Second Amendment. He legally had a weapon with him and he drew his weapon and stopped the man who was uh, doing the mass shooting from doing any further shooting. And all of this is a like story of brokenness, of reasons why we need protection, but it tells us something else when it goes to a whole other extreme that the story is told that this man, this 22-year-old man who was eating in the food court with his wife and who stopped this mass shooting is hailed as, did you see this, have you Googled this, the Good Samaritan. In our culture, we call someone who is uh, legally carrying a handgun and is put into a position where he has to take the life of somebody else, a Good Samaritan. And this makes me worry about this. It makes me worry about the people turned in on ourselves. It makes me worry about how we've become so worried about our own protection and our own safety that we're altering or manipulating the story. I don't know that what this 22-year-old man did was a bad thing. He was legally bearing his gun. But instead of saying, what a shame that he had to do that, we lifted him up as a good Samaritan. By the way, the good Samaritan heals and brings life. Uh, and I know that that doesn't fit this situation, which is why I'm sort of scratching my head because Good Samaritan is not what he should be called at all. We should be saying uh, saddened that, that he had to be like this or behave like this. There's a lot to think about with why the Second Amendment is important, but there's also a lot to think about about the way we speak and how turned in on self we are. How often we have stored in our barns a story and a history of violence and how guns are such a part of our culture and our discussion and what we watch and what we participate in and how we've so easily grasped onto that for security instead of we're legally doing a thing like bearing arms, grasping onto the God who cares for us all and who calls us into a community where some of us may be bearing arms legally and may be forced uh, into a situation where they're used, but where we're called to a deeper kind of existence. I'm concerned about you and I merely existing instead of really living. I'm concerned about how often I find that I'm turned in on self. And my sense is, is that you're a part of this too. And the offer for us from this gospel is an offer of freedom from this. Can you remember uh, all the way back to, uh, let's say, March of 2020? Can you remember all the way back to March of about 2020? This is a painful memory and maybe it's hard to think back that far. Earlier I asked you to think back to the 80s, then we talked about the 90s. I'm going back a couple years and that can be hard. But do you remember March of 2020? Do you remember uh, that the, the, the pandemic began to set in? And as the pandemic set in, 
we would visit stores and we would go to like our Costco or our grocery store where we would buy toilet paper and we would find that the whole section is empty, devoid of toilet paper. Do you remember this? Do you remember uh, that feeling of uh, all these people stocking up on toilet paper and what that felt like and how that looked? I mention it because the problem at that point was not that there wasn't enough toilet paper. That is not what the issue was. No, the issue was is that people wanted to make sure that they had more toilet paper than they would need for years and years. They were buying as many Costco packages as possible and emptying the racks out. It was becoming a demand issue because people were living out this sort of practical atheism where the trust was going to literally be in toilet paper instead of in the other parts of the supply chain and neighbors who could help provide and care if, if you needed something like this. And so the whole sort of chaos of this turned out to be this story of what it looks like when you and I turn in on ourselves. And I wonder if we're sometimes just existing, if we're not uh, just trying to secure our lives for ourselves like this sort of practical atheism. And I wonder if at the same time we wonder why things don't feel as deep or as meaningful or as vital as they could. The question of today's gospel is a question of letting go. And it's a question not of letting go of your rights, but of letting go of the belief that you are the most important thing and you are the only person who can take care of you. And it's about doing more than turning in on yourself. It's about knowing that God's creation is this wide and deep expanse and that you are part of it and I am part of it and security is part of it. I am not as a pastor saying that we should throw out all the swords and guns because to be honest if we did that uh, I know what our culture and our society would look like. I know that there are all sorts of issues with how to thank and lift up our policemen and women but these are people uh, who are trained to live in our midst in a society that has filled its storehouses with stories of violence and guns. And even more than that, it's filled its uh, stories with turning in on self. We just have to leap back to where uh, we want to be. We just have to leap back to where we feel at home. We want to make that quantum leap and it's all about us. We can just fashion the proper uh, uh, duct tape and battery car and we'll escape and we'll get there and uh, we will be that guy. We'll be Michael Knight inside of our car that's uh, given to us to use for our mission. And it's about us and we'll slowly turn in on self and that mission might be even more deluxe than a car. It might give us the string fellow hawk like mission of Airwolf and we might uh, be faced with some of the issues of wonder years where it's a trying to come to grips with how to live in the midst of the world that we're set in. It's a sort of coming of age story. And so this is a reminder about what we sometimes tend to fall into and it's being addressed or spoken about. I'm thinking about it with you, not to make you feel guilty about what gun you own. As long as you do that legally, this isn't about that. But it is about naming a habit that we have and that where we let go of turning in on self and where we acknowledge what our storehouses are filled with and what things we've put our confidence in that are just things of existence, we can begin to move into a day, a week, a month, a lifetime of deeper living. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the television shows of the 90s or the 80s or even the 2000s. There's nothing wrong with enjoying your life and uh, participating in uh, recreational, relaxing things. This may be something a little different than that, though. It may be a call towards more than just existing for self. It's a call towards uh, letting go and really living. Our cultural issues of violence and guns all of those things are probably not going to be answered in totality by you and I. But we can think about some of the habits that we have and how easy it is for us to turn in on ourselves and to place our idea of security in tangible sort of off uh, 
the off-brand storytelling and fame. Freedom for you looks like doing more than just getting by. It's living in concert with others. The whole toilet paper fear is kind of crazy. You don't think that you know somebody who would have a few rolls of toilet paper that you could use? In that is a story of the gospel, the gospel that frees us from how we want to live, that helps us in Christ be risen into a life of how God wants us to live. That's why we're here today. It's hard to think about money and greed and even guns, and it's probably crazy to think that I'm even thinking about it. John, why would you bring this stuff up? Well, because it's in my mind and it's part of the world that we live in. But more than that, I'm thinking about how easy it is for you, how easy it is for me to turn in on ourselves, and how this isn't deep and abundant living. I am done just existing. I'm done as a practical atheist, putting all of my confidence in myself. I'm ready to really live. And to really live is to let go in some ways, to look outward, to find depth and abundance in care, in shared security, in security for all and not just self. Because God has made this creation and set us in, a, in it, and it's time for our disconnect or our turn to self to die so that we may raise to a whole new depth, a whole new needed place of existence. And this is what God has to offer in thinking about the world that we live in and in thinking about it differently. This is a day to no longer turn in, but to lift our heads and our hands up high, to look for the Holy Spirit and to ask for security, for self, and for all of us. This is the kingdom of God on earth. Amen. Benevolent God, thank you for calling us to this place and providing us with the opportunity to consider again who we are and the way that we live. We know that you are the source, the guide, the goal of our lives. And we ask that you would teach us to love more than self, to appreciate who we are, but to appreciate who we are in the midst of a world whose gifts we are given to work in conjunction with. Help us to remember what is worth loving and help us to reject what is offensive to you. We can only do this through your Holy Spirit. Help us to treasure what is precious in your sight and help us do all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor kind of long thing to sit through and a lot to think about this morning, but I do believe that God has called us to deeper lives, and I hope that you can hear the call of the Holy Spirit and that you can prayerfully be moved into this by God's love. You are meant to do more than just exist today and to just sort of clamp down on self. You 